Friends, if you would, turn with me now to John chapter 6. John 6, we'll look at verses 41 to 58. Again, um, we've been going through the Gospel of John, and in particular in the 6th chapter. The 6th chapter tells one consistent story, and it really highlights the difference between the way that the disciples of Jesus respond to Jesus, and then the crowds of people respond to Jesus. We see that story going back and forth in the 6th chapter. Today, Jesus um, is responding to these crowds of Jewish people who have come to find him. But they, they don't really want Jesus. What they want is more of the, the miracles that he's performed. They, they ate of the loaves and the fish, and they want more. They want more miracle food. And Jesus, in the verses we'll read today, is just really highlighting what's going on inside their hearts as they respond, not to Jesus, but to, but to the stuff. And um, you'll hear that as we read. John chapter 6, verses 41 to 58 this morning. Therefore the Jews were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. They were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I've come down out of heaven? Jesus answered and said to them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. It's written in the prophets, and they shall be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I give for the life of the world is my flesh. And then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood... You have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So he who eats me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers who ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Think about the person you're closest to in your life. Maybe, maybe it is a best friend, someone that you've you know, grown up with, gone through a lot of things with. Or maybe it's your children. Or your parents. Those are people who we often get really close to and they see our ups and downs, our good sides and our bad sides. Or maybe, as we're thinking about it, maybe the closest we can think of of two people coming together is maybe a husband and a wife. After all, the scripture says of a husband and a wife that these two become one flesh. Can't get much closer than one flesh, can you? Well, um, it's interesting that when we're with someone, no matter who that person is, when we're with them long enough, they change us. You've been changed by that person that you're thinking of, haven't you? They've changed you. They've shaped who you are, your character, your personality. In 1987, the researchers in Michigan tested a hypothesis that people in long-term relationships actually begin to look like the person that they're in a long-term relationship with. They physically begin to look like them. It's because they share life together, right? They have the same, they go through the same sort of emotions and they see the expressions on their partner's face and they begin to mimic those expressions and, and so their smile lines are in the same places and their face begins to be shaped the same way. It's remarkable, isn't it? That we, that we actually, when we're in a long-term relationship with somebody, we actually start to look like them. Crazy. It's the sort of saying begins to become true that, that birds of a feather flock together. You've heard that one? Even the Apostle Paul says, 
that bad company corrupts good morals. Those people that we're around for an extended period of time are inevitably going to influence the people that we become for better or worse. And, and, and the more time that you spend with someone, the more they're going to influence you. The more they're going to change who you are. I have to think we hold that in mind when we hear Jesus' words. And he says, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. If we're not really careful, I mean really careful, a lot of the ancient church fathers made this mistake, but if we're not careful, we make the same mistake the Jews in the story did, and they take Jesus literally. And that's actually why they leave, many people leave Jesus. If you read on down to verse 66, you'll see that many of the people leave Jesus because of this hard thing that he says. You've got to eat my flesh and, and drink my blood. So are we supposed to take that literally? How gross to eat someone's flesh, right? To, is Jesus suggesting some sort of cannibalistic horror scene here? No, I don't, I don't think so. I think what Jesus is trying to describe when he says... You've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. He's trying to describe an intimacy more intense than anything we've ever experienced. So intense, in fact, that we really have nothing to compare it to. How do you describe something that you have no point of reference for? How do you, how do you describe, for instance, how do you describe purple to someone who is born blind? How do you describe the sound of a bird singing in a tree or a babbling brook to someone who's born deaf? I'll tell you how. With a, a lot of misunderstandings. Very clumsily. You, you're talking about something for which the person has no frame of reference in their life. They've never experienced anything in that sort of dimension ever before. And, and here's Jesus trying his very best to describe spiritual life to people who have been born spiritually dead. How do you do that? <laughs> well, he gets the closest that I think anyone can possibly get. Quite, quite frankly, the closest anyone could have gotten. Jesus gets there. He wants to say, I am the bread of life. To really, to really live, Jesus says. It's like, it's like eating me. It's like drinking me. You have to take me into your system daily. You have to be strengthened by me. You have to be changed and transformed by ingesting me. I think this is where Jesus is getting. Jesus' invitation into these verses is to unparalleled intimacy like nothing we've ever experienced. He calls us to be closer to him than anyone. You can't be closer to someone than when you take them into yourself, when you ingest them. You say, I, 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 Lord, I want to know your word better than I know anything else in this life. I want to feel your presence more than I want to feel anything else. I want to taste your goodness every single hour of every day. He invites us. He invites us to be so intimate with him that he becomes our constant pursuit. That we think about him more than we think about our next meal. More than we think about our next breath. This is how intimate he calls us to be with him. And you know what? You, you can see, you can recognize this in people. When they're this close with Jesus, you can see it in them. Because they've been changed to be more like him. I, uh, I, I look to people... And I, I encourage you to think about this. Do you know people in your life like that that are just so transformed by Jesus that they're admirable? You look up to them and you say, I, I have these men in my life that I look up to and I say, wow, someday I hope to be as mature as you are in your faith. And what I'm really saying when I say that is, uh, someday I hope to be more like Jesus. Because that's what they're doing. They're, they're pursuing Jesus. They're becoming more and more like him. These are men who... Read the Bible more than I read it, who in prayer more than I'm in prayer, who's walked with the Lord longer than I've walked with the Lord, and I just look at them in awe at, at the way that their relationship with, with Jesus has changed them to be more and more like Jesus. So let me ask you something. 
Who do you spend most of your time with? You know, one of the things I've learned as I grow up, it's fun growing up because you get to learn lots of things in life. <laughs> one of those things I've learned is that you can usually tell the kind of company that someone keeps uh, by what kind of person they are. They've been influenced by people. So if you're an angry person, I bet that you have some pretty prominent people in your life who are also angry people. I can almost guarantee it. And you probably watch uh, news stations where the view is that everybody's angry at the world. I bet, I bet that if you are a happy person, it probably means that there's been someone in your life who's been a constant influence of joy on you. They change you to, to be happy because you're around them all the time. I bet if you're an anxious person, you're the kind of person who's on the phone regularly with other people who are worried about all sorts of things in the world and you're watching the news and listening to all the things that you could be worried about, it influences you. If you're a patient person, it's probably because somebody at some point in your life in a very influential way was, was patient with you. If you believe that the earth is flat, <laughs> It's probably because you've spent a lot of time on some conspiracy theory websites and watching a lot of YouTube videos. We are not, we are not simply uh, some kind of detached information processing machine. We're spiritual beings. And we're influenced by what we take in spiritually. It changes us. It changes us. Some of you are realizing right now that what you've been eating spiritually needs to change. A lot less Facebook, a lot less Fox News and CNN, a lot less worldly worried people, and a lot more Jesus. Look at verse 44. It's a particularly important verse, but it's also a very difficult one. Jesus says in verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. The sentence has three parts. The first part is a universal negative. The second part is an exception. And the third is the result of the exception. So let's, let me begin with that universal negative. In that verse, Jesus says, No one can come to me. No one can come to me. In those words, Jesus describes the universal condition of all human beings everywhere. One bit of wisdom that I've gained in recent years Again, as you get older, you gain a little bit more and more of this. People always ultimately do what they want. Did you know that? People ultimately do what they want to do. Now, there are things that we do we don't want to do in the, in the short term. I'm thinking of when my daughter was young, uh, Emma, when she was first, first born. I didn't want to change her diapers, but I did. But I, even that, I did it because ultimately what I wanted was for her to be happy and healthy, right? I'm doing what I want to do, ultimately. And that's what everybody does. They do what they want to do, ultimately. Now with that in mind, here Jesus stands in front of this crowd, this crowd that he fed just the day before with miraculous loaves and fish, and he says to them, no one can come to me. Well, wait a minute. They just sought him out. They just found him. They just sailed across a lake to get to him. What does he mean when he says, no one can come to me? Well, Jesus means that, that what, they want is, what they want is more bread, not more Jesus. That's what Jesus means. And that's the condition of every single human heart. Adam and Eve preferred to have the fruit instead of God. And it's been the same ever since. It's been the same ever since. Sometimes people get upset at this verse because they suppose that it means a lack of freedom. As though God prohibits people from coming to him. But let's be clear, God prohibits no one from coming to him. You hear that? No one. Scripture is clear. God desires all men to be saved. All men to be saved. He's never prohibited a single soul from coming to him, ever. So this is not Jesus limiting your freedom. It's Jesus describing your heart. You can't come to Jesus because you don't want Jesus. And people always ultimately do what they want. 
And, and not because, and, and it's because of our fallen and our broken nature that this universal statement rings true. Nobody wants Jesus ever. We want his stuff. We want to be known as a good person. We, maybe we want to be known as a Christian. But and nobody in this room, nobody on this planet wants Jesus because we prefer to be left alone in our sin. What's interesting, about, what's interesting about critics of predestination, the main criticism, is that predestination is unfair. It's an unfair doctrine, they say. But you only think that if you misunderstand human nature. Because if you think that people are basically good, and they basically make good choices, then yeah, predestination is unfair. Because what that means is Jesus, there are people out there who want what's good. They want Jesus, and Jesus is not letting them come. That is unfair. But what I'm saying is this. Nobody wants Jesus. Nobody wants Jesus. Everybody wants to go their own way. Everybody wants to do the sinful things that they want to do, and they want to do it without God. And so what does God do? The furthest thing from what's unfair he gives people exactly what they want. And what they want is to sin without him forever. And that's the fate of every human soul because every single person in their natural heart has rejected God. And that's why Jesus says, no one can come to me. Not because they're able, but because they don't want to. But there's an exception to this statement, and it comes next. Jesus goes on to say this. He says, unless, unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now this word draw, Father who sent me to draw him, it's, in the Greek word it's called el, uh, el kuo. You don't have to remember that. <laughs> el kuo. But it is a word that's used several other places in the New Testament, and I want to give us a sense of this word, el kuo. So let me show you a few other places. Acts 16, 19 says this, But when her master saw that the hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. That same Greek word is used there, dragged, dragged them. James 2.6 says this, But you who have dishonored the poor man, is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Same word, dragged. It's, it's used elsewhere for dragging fishing nets and for drawing the sword. It's not a passive or persuasive sort of word that's used there. It's a forceful and compelling word. In fact, based on the word's usage elsewhere in the New Testament, it might be better to translate our verse this way, friends. No one can come to, unless the Father who sent me drags him. Even that, though, misses something. It misses something. What I was saying earlier, that people always do what they ultimately want. In whatever way someone is dragged to Jesus, it's never against their will. Rather, it's because their will has been changed. In the hymn, Come Thou Fount, there's this great line. It goes like this. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. A fetter, a chain. The hymn is a prayer that God would imprison our hearts in his goodness because we know that unless God holds us there, we will wander away into our own destruction. Here's what this means. Jesus is good. In Him is the fullness of life. In Him is forgiveness of sins. In Him is joy now and joy forever. All you have to do is want Him. But you have to want Him more than you want anything else in this life. And you can't do that. 
But God can change that in you. And maybe He already is. Maybe He already is at work doing that. But I know that there are people in this room, and certainly in this world, who are never, 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 never going to want Jesus that much. They're just not. They'll always want their sin away from God. And God is such a fair God that He's going to give them what they want. Forever. But there are others of you whom God will open your eyes. Even though you insist on keeping them shut, He's going to open your eyes. And when you do, you're going to see Jesus and all His beauty and all His glory and all His love and all His life. And after seeing Him, in comparison to Him, you'll never want to look at anything else again. The closest... Well, as we draw to the last part here, the, the result of having seen Jesus, here's this last phrase in, verse, in the verse we're looking at. I will raise him up on the last day. This is a promise of resurrection. And we believe, because the scriptures teach, that at the end of time as we know it, Jesus is going to come back to earth, and he's going to resurrect the dead. He's going to resurrect every single person that has ever lived. And those who have rejected him will get exactly what they want. They'll get to be apart from him forever. And those who have come to him will get exactly what they want. They'll get to be with Jesus forever. In the end, everybody gets what they want. The closest human thing I can compare this to is marriage. Marriage in the way that it changes you. The way that it changes, not just you, changes what you want. When Brittany and I first started dating, um, she didn't like seafood at all. N wouldn't touch it. Couldn't, I mean, I had to beg and plead to go to a seafood restaurant, and then she'd order a salad or something. But over the years, she's eaten more and more seafood, and she's gotten to the point now where I think she likes seafood more than I do. She changed her. When we first started dating, uh, we would go to a restaurant, and uh, after one of the courses was done, it didn't matter what it was, appetizer, the entree, the dessert, whatever it was, she would start stacking the plates on the table. And it drove me nuts. I hated that. I said, the, the waiter's going to get this stuff. Don't worry about that. The other day, just last week, we went out to eat, and guess who was stacking the plates? It changed me. <laughs> she changed me. <laughs> when you're with someone that long, it changes the things that you want, doesn't it? You know, there's not going to be anyone in hell who's ha who is a happy person. It's an awful and it is a tormenting eternity. No, I'm not going to hold any punches back on that. But you know what? If those same people were to come to heaven... They wouldn't be happy there either. And you know why? Because it's not what they want. It never has been. The new heaven and the new earth, it'll be what Jesus wants. It'll be his kingdom. And the only way to enjoy that as much as you possibly can for all eternity, the only way for you to do that is to spend as much time with Jesus now as you can. To be changed so that you want what He wants. So that you like what He likes. Because that's exactly what heaven will be like. And the best part of it all, you'll be there with Him. The one that you want most. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you've given us Jesus, that you've opened our eyes to see how good he is and, and how desirable he is. Help us to feed on him every day, Lord, every hour. Bring our Savior to mind. Shape us so that we have the same sorts of desires that he has. Help us to look forward to his kingdom because it's his and we love him. Lord, assure us of that resurrection that is still to come and give us strength for today. In Jesus' name, amen.